Are you missing six-man co-host Mike Myers? Well, you don't have to. Go to geekbrunchpodcast.com and explore all of Mike's podcast universe, including my favorite, Mike M's Weekly Reads, to stay up to date with Mike's personal reading list. you got Geek Brunch, a bi-weekly celebration of geek culture with Mike and Bill Bomer, where they dish about comics, movies, TVs, and even food sometimes. you got DC Noise, focusing on Mike's favorite publisher, DC, Collector's Corner, DC Everything Else, another favorite of mine, and Geek Brunch Retro. So feel free to go find Mike at geekbrunchpodcast.com. It's time once again for our winter giveaway. This giveaway is very simple to enter. Um, be a patron. So the easiest way to enter is go to patreon.com slash comicsfunprofit. Become a patron at any level at our Patreon um, site. And you can do it that way. You can also enter by going to Threadless and buying some merch and tagging us in a photo of you in said merch. So if you like one of our T-shirts or hats or whatever, and you go to th- you go to comicsfunprofit.threadless.com and find uh, all our merch and like some of it, buy it, wear it. You can either tag us in social. Uh, with you wearing it or send us a photo of you wearing it and you're entered. So those are the two ways. Be a patron and buy merch. Um, and then you get entered in our, in our winter giveaway, which is fun swag giveaways of, um, photos and stickers and signed comics. Um, just like our fall giveaway was. And we had five lucky winners win stuff in our fall, fall giveaway. So we're hoping to um, have as many entrants this time that we can give away that many again. So be a patron, buy merch, enter the winter giveaway. Aloha, it's Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing a friend of the show, Eric Palicki. He is here to promote Blacksmith, the key to his heart trade paperback from Ahoy Comics. It comes out on Wednesday, um, February 14th, I love this title. It's a cool title, and I think it's the perfect time that they are releasing this trade that's coming out on Valentine's Day. I think it's awesome. It's great. (laughs) Eric, welcome to the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. How are you doing today? Aloha, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. Like I said, thank you very much. Now, for new listeners, I just want to go over some of Eric's works. Eric, Please feel free to jump in or add anything or, and I'm being honest, correct me if I missed anything or if I missed, um, um, or if I said something wrong. So, so sure. Eric has written Atlantis wasn't built for tourists. He has written no angel. Um, he has written and correct me if I'm wrong. I, um, you've also edited um, dead beats and dead beats London calling. Is that correct? I know you wrote yes. Some, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I wrote stories for each of those volumes as well as as editing the mm-hmm. the anthologies for A Wave Blue World, yes. which is the publisher. Yes, and then also too, um, you also now correct me if I'm wrong. You were you were an editor, and also you, I think you wrote a couple stories for All We Ever Wanted. Is that correct? Yes, All We Ever Wanted, as well as the sequel volume, which was called Maybe Someday. Again, those were uh, science fiction anthologies that we produced. Uh, my co-editor Matt Miner and I for uh, Away Blue World, mm-hmm. and then um, sorry, oh uh, yeah, I've got I've got to pick up those trades, um, listeners. We I know we just mentioned about Deadbeats and Deadbeats Calling London Call Deadbeats London Calling. Those are horror anthologies. I love that format. Um, I can't re- I I don't know what the um or like the Mistress of the Dark's name. She's like the host of it through the whole um graphic now and i love yeah yeah the shopkeeper she was a uh kind of a a riff uh so for the for the listeners uh sorry to to kind of uh derail the conversation but uh, for the listeners the the two deadbeats volumes are uh anthologies and they take place inside a haunted record store and the uh the, the the proprietress of the shop we who we called the shopkeeper uh, it, which is a riff, of course, on the Crypt Keeper, mm-hmm. kind of serves as your master of ceremonies to introduce various stories. And 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 the whole book kind of takes the form of 
this this mysterious shopkeeper leading a new customer through the store and explaining where everything is, where the used instruments are and the records mm -hmm. and the and the, the the merchandise. And then that leads into various stories. And we were able to, to get just a number of incredible talents, Jody Hauser, Lila Sturgis, mm -hmm. Ron Mars, um, you know, oh, just to name a few yeah. uh, in the in the two and uh, the two anthologies. We had just a number of great contributors. And then uh, those were co-edited by myself and Joe Carello. Uh, and then each of us also mm -hmm. produced a story. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to continue on, Eric. You have, you've also... Um had a very successful Kickstarter with Manticore that you wrote. Um, let's see. Also, of course, in the first volume, Blacksmith, of course, from Ahoy Comics and Ninja Kaiden. Now, I'm going to ask you, um, can you please update us on the next volume of this series? Yes. So the first volume of Ninja Kaiden was done by myself and, and Lucas Meyer. Now, Lucas, of course, has gone on and is doing fantastic work at DC now he's drawing uh you know he's doing Titans work with with Tom Taylor mm -hmm. uh and has gotten to work with Danny Lore you know a couple of friends of mine in the industry so I'm very excited for him so he has moved on but we are in the process of planning a second volume of Ninja Kaidan that I will write uh introduces some some new exciting wrinkles into the mythology of this kind of gonzo ninjas fighting ghosts uh, action adventure story that I was able to put together for Black Box. Okay, that's great. I'm I'm really looking forward to this um, for that next volume. Um, Eric, is there anything you want to add, or did I miss anything? Um, I think you uh you got the 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 broad strokes. Mm -hmm. I think that's um you know I'm at that point. I'm I'm blessed to be at that point where I have work that I often forget about. Mm -hmm. uh, so. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but no, no, those are the, those are the more recent projects that I've been involved in. Okay. All right. Now, before we get started, I just want to give a big shout out to Hannah Behedry of Superfan Promotions. Hannah, thank you very much for asking us, Comics for Fun and Profit, to interview Eric. And thank you very much for sending me an advanced reading copy. Eric, do you want to add anything to that? No, I just want to echo uh, just my appreciation for Hannah and also uh, David Hyde at Superfan Promotions. Mm -hmm. And also really just want to say thank you to Ahoy for making this yes. project possible. Yes. You know, including my my editor, Sarah Litt, who has been a big advocate for this book all along. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, um, listeners, I got some of my information from um, the YouTube podcast, Blake's Bud, that was dated... Um, Oh God, it was dated, you know, just a few days ago. I can't, I lost the date. <laughs> anyway, so if you guys just go to Blake's Blood, um YouTube um, channel um, page uh, and and you, I think it's just simply titled Interviewing um, Eric Palicki. But if you guys get a chance, please check out that fun interview. It was a great interview. I, uh, as much as I could, I tried to watch it live. Uh, something came up, and I just finished watching a little bit later after the sh uh, after you guys did the live um show. Um, Eric, where can listeners follow you on social media and also sure. promote your website too? Sure, I have a website that is uh, poorly maintained at ericpolicki.com, and then I am on all of the social platforms at Eric Palicki. So X, Twitter, whatever you choose to call it. Uh, uh, uh blue sky threads instagram i'm i'm at eric palicki on all of those platforms so please give me a follow uh mm -hmm. it's usually the same information repeated across four platforms but uh you know i try to i try to maintain a presence on all of them oh that's great no that is great okay now before we start getting into the second issue the uh, second volume of blacksmith i'm going to ask for like you know, who, if it's a new listener or a, a listener that's been on, you know, has followed us, but has no idea about what Blacksmith from Ahoy Comics is about. May I ask you, can you go over some of the or the main characters? Like, yeah, absolutely. Jane, Strummer, Mercado. Sure. Yeah. So Janie, Janie Jones, Mercado, called Strummer. 
a nickname she originally earned from her father because uh, as she will tell you, she inherited two things from her dad. She inherited a love of the the band, The Clash, uh, mm -hmm. and she is a werewolf. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but she also, uh, at least in the first volume, very much kind of denies that supernatural side of her life. And she yes. is working as a private investigator. Uh, and trying hard to ignore the supernatural underbelly that exists in Los Angeles where she mm -hmm. lives and works. Uh, and the, the kind of driving force of our first volume is, is a case of a lifetime that unfortunately pulls her back into that supernatural side of her life and things spiral out of control from there. Mm -hmm. um, sort of joining her on her adventure are uh, her partner Ben Silat, who mm -hmm. is a he is a he's by his own account half gin or genie, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to Anglicanize the word. Um, and they together have a a dog who is actually a ghost, uh, a cemetery grim, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the uh, the 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 main client. Uh, although he eventually becomes something more than a client uh, and not in a good way is Rainsford Black, mm -hmm. who is a, uh, he is, he is a wealthy, a person of indeterminate wealth who lives yes. in outside Los Angeles. And uh, he hires Strummer and Ben to find 30 stolen bullets mm -hmm. that he claims are made from the 30 pieces of silver that were given to Judas, mm -hmm. uh, which makes them incredibly potent for killing monsters, which is his hobby and passion is that he is a big game hunter, but he specializes in, in hunting supernatural beasts. Um, of course, them being silver bullets, that compels Strummer to take the case in spite of her... Uh, self-imposed refusal to to get involved in the supernatural mm -hmm. and of course things spiral out of control from there okay um you pointed on um the first volume of blacksmith because and because it's been about a i think it's been about a year since we talked about i can't remember but <laughs> but i remember and you can correct me if i'm wrong because i think the first volume janie She's, I remember, I think there were only a couple of times she turned into a werewolf in that first volume. Is that correct? I, I can't. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so for me, the kind of driving force behind the, the high concept here as a werewolf private detective mm -hmm. is the idea that being a wolf, being a canine, being a dog would give you certain advantages if that was your vocation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. You have enhanced senses. Yes. Um, and, you know, if if things if worse came to worst, you would have uh, a leg up or, or you know, you'd have <laughs> certain advantages in a, in a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, so. But I didn't want to make that the whole story. So, mm -hmm. yes, she does occasionally use her her werewolf abilities and mm -hmm. turn into a werewolf, but it's not. It's not a crutch that she uses. Again, this is mm -hmm. a part of her life that she is trying to ignore, trying to distance herself from this aspect mm -hmm. of herself, yeah. uh, which is a big part of the story is about her eventually embracing who and what she mm -hmm. is. And in the first volume, we leave her in a pretty good place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you know, this is noir fiction. So as we start to talk about the second volume, you, you can't leave the happily ever after there. You have to kind of upend her life. Mm -hmm. And that's, yes. that's kind of what we see in the, in the first couple issues of the new, of the new mm -hmm. volume. Before we move on to the second volume, because one, one thing I wanted to ask you was like, I love it when, when, whenever she turns into a werewolf and she does more of it in the second volume, blacksmith, the key to his um key to his heart is that, she doesn't turn into the traditional where a movie werewolf where it's like, you know, when they change their clothes are ripped, you know, they, 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 they just, um, their physique changes and they start, you know, their clothes is being ripped off and, 
and and she, you know it looks like a a wolf on you know standing on two legs but basically Janie um she's able to still retain um her features some of her features you know um you know i i you know like were, were you trying to like break break that stereotypical idea of what a werewolf is or you wanted to add something a little different or was it something you found in the mythologies or you you see all kinds of different interpretations of what a werewolf would look like after the turn and yes. you know it kind of goes a little bit more into that uh practical effects lon cheney yes werewolf transformation that that we did with this and uh I, I i wanted her to maintain her faculties to yes like not be a uh you know a complete and total uncontrollable monster mm -hmm. but at the same time to have werewolf aspects to her so yeah her 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 snout becomes elongated and her ears transform mm -hmm. and she gets she gets <clears throat> hairier and her arms lengthen but it's not it's not like she turns into the Incredible Hulk here, mm -hmm, um, yeah. and I also I also didn't want her to become this unstoppable force because from a from a storytelling standpoint, that's also no fun for me to make mm -hmm. her completely unstoppable and 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 somehow perfect when she transforms. Mm, okay, all right. Um, no, well, thank you very much, Eric. Oh, let's just jump in. Blacksmith, the key to his heart. I'm going to read this quote. That's the back of the trade. Paliki is crafting a top tier detective story with this series. That's a quote from the Nerd Initiative. I agree with this high praise. This is it, it, I. I've read the you know I've read this. It's a it's very good, Eric. Um, I'm going to ask the question so. You know, what is this new case that Strummer is working on in this new in this um, new volume? Sure. So, in the first volume, uh, I I I tried purposely to make the first issue a tight standalone issue, where if you picked up the first issue and you didn't like it, uh, you know, first of all, shame on you. But second <laughs> of all. Um, <laughs> You know, it was I was leaving you with something that was a, a relatively safe, self-contained unit of entertainment. Yes. And of course, it leads into the larger case, uh, you know, at the end of the very first issue, it leads into the larger case that, yes. that Rainsford hires her for. And I did try to do something very similar with this second, the second volume in the first issue. Strummer has been hired to find a missing teenager, yes. uh, a run, a teenage runaway, uh, Claire. And. Uh, while she has a successful resolution to that case in the first issue without spoiling anything and some of the revelations that that come about as a as a result of figuring out that case uh it also sort of then leads into the second big case of the issue which yes. is she receives a mysterious package mm -hmm. ostensibly but not necessarily with uh from from Rainsford Black Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, and the book is called Black Smith, so I couldn't leave Rainsford Black out of the story, even mm -hmm. in him. It's really Strummer's book. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so his his presence is felt. So the the appearance of this mysterious package and its contents lead Strummer and Ben back down the rabbit hole into this this world that's that strummer and ben and rainsford all inhabit this supernatural underground mm -hmm. that exists within mm -hmm. the city of los angeles and last los angeles because you know that's such a traditional noir setting you know mm -hmm. the the you know the, the the chinatowns and the you know whether you have mm -hmm. chinatown on one hand which is a very traditional detective story or blade runner which takes place in yeah. You know, which is just as much of a noir story, but also has robots in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I figure we can we can set it right in a happy medium here uh, yes. of Los Angeles. <laughs> um, Eric, I've already told you my 
thoughts before we start a recording. I love this story because the case that she's working on is so complex. And yet it's it's what I love about it, it's complex, but yet and, and it's um I'm just trying to figure out the mystery, but it, I love it because it's you're still going, come on, let there's a we need to, you know, don't stop. We still have to read the next issue to figure out what's going because I keep thinking it's going to go this way. And one turn is like, no, there's another turn. I got to go. I just, you know, I just love it. I'm, it's a dumb question, but I'm going to ask, how did you come up with this story? Like, you know, well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so for the first volume and, you know, apologies to the listeners that, uh, you know, I really hope that this will drive listeners who have read and enjoyed the first volume to pick up the second volume. Yes. But I also hope that it will uh, drive listeners who haven't read the first to pick up both. Yes. The first volume is very much patterned on the Maltese Falcon, which is oh, okay. one of my favorite yes. movies of all time. Uh, you know, with the you know, the MacGuffin, the the Maltese Falcon itself being replaced by these missing bullets. And so the second volume, uh, another classic bogey noir, you know, it is it is definitely, uh, you know, this is this is very much, uh, you know, a big sleep type of of story. And, okay. uh, you know, <sighs> And the best noir stories for me are less about the case yes. and the twists of the case and about the, the human interaction and the sort of lingering and lurking darkness mm -hmm. of these characters. And so there is definitely, uh, you know, this one is much more about the vibe, the noir mm -hmm. vibe than the first volume. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, the, the, the antagonist of the story, while not Rainsford Black, remains very formidable and is, and is manipulating things behind the scenes and is mm -hmm. causing all of this chaos and destruction in, in Strummer's Wake. And it's kind of about, you know, once you've achieved what you think is a happy ending, how mm -hmm. the, then do you accommodate for, you know, chaos agents that come in and up up you know yes try to rock the boat okay listeners like i said and as me and eric we you know um as eric has mentioned it's like um if you read just blacksmith the key to his heart also you know you have, please pick up the first volume of blacksmith because it's with these two together it's a great story it's a great story of um Janie's um journey and also not only her relationship with Ben but also her relationship with Rainsford Black yes. because it seems like this and I'll like say I'm not spoiling but it seems like um her relationship with Rainsford gets a it it's um um it's a, it starts to show it's a little bit more complex now. It's a little more comp. It's it's just great, you know. I, I don't I don't know how else to put it. I'm a lost for words right now. But, um, Eric, I'm going to ask you. Let me just. I'm going to continue to move on. So, sure. who are some of the new characters in this volume? Like we got, we have um, Claire, right? Yes. Yeah. So Claire is a new character. Uh, she is the the runaway that I mentioned in mm -hmm. that that kind of takes center stage in the uh in the first issue and mm -hmm. then later becomes a, a an intern in the detective agency yes and the uh uh the the decision to bring her on as an intern is something that strummer makes is it is a decision that strummer makes off the cuff mm -hmm. and not involving Ben in that decision leads to a little bit of tension between the two of them throughout mm -hmm. the issue throughout the story. Uh, so, but you know, uh, Claire is a character with with secrets of her own and really does uh, 
even though while she seems to be just a, a side character, uh, does actually end up playing, I think, a larger role in the mystery yes. as we move forward. I don't want to spoil too much. Oh, no, yes, so, I know, yeah. So uh, allow me to tiptoe around uh, some of these Oh yes, these these character descriptions a little bit. Yes, um, let's see. I'm gonna um, talk briefly about Beatrice, and again, again, listeners, we're not spoiling anything, but these are some of these characters. We can't talk too much about it, but um, yeah, if you could just talk a little bit about Beatrice. Sure, Beatrice is that uh, that aforementioned chaos agent, the one who is uh, messing with uh with strummer's life and mm -hmm. with some of the with the lives of uh the other main characters and i don't want to tell say too much but yes, yes. She, she's a very important force to be reckoned with in the story who and what she is and why she's mm -hmm. important uh is is revealed so yes. just know that you know beatrice is 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 our is our driving force our antagonist in this story and I'm not spoiling this, Eric, but correct me if I'm wrong, because I know in the second issue, we are introduced to Beatrice. And then I think in like the third and fourth issue of this trade, she's really not, she's not, we don't really see her, but her presence is felt. That's Absolutely. All okay. Yes. All right. Um, One car or if you can, now, and... Is it is it Mad Madeline? Madeline, yes. Uh, so Madeline, Madeline oh, is yes. Madeline is uh you know, in the first issue or in the first volume, we're we're introduced to the fact that this supernatural underbelly of Los Angeles is populated by all kinds of creatures out of myth and legend. We have mm -hmm. vampires, we have the Minotaur, we have uh, Galatea, who works for Rainsford Black and is the actual living statue out of Greek mythology. We have uh, vampires. We have werewolves and, and jinn, mm -hmm. of course. So in the second volume, as Strummer pursues her, her quarry, mm -hmm. uh, she enlists the help and the aid of witches right mm -hmm. so that's the that's the next sort of supernatural being that we in, in, introduce mm -hmm. and so Ma madeline serves the purpose as of kind of providing uh strummer with some information and of course mm -hmm. the cost that that information incurs mm -hmm. dr drives a lot of the story yes. in the second volume yes i'm going to ask um and then the um actually a couple more characters. Um Carly, can you talk about her a little bit? Yeah. So so Carly is introduced in the first volume mm -hmm. uh as uh, a client turned paramour of Strummers. Mm -hmm. And where we start the uh where we start the second volume is that that relationship has has progressed and blossomed yes and all of the all of the chaos all of the darkness that is encroaching strummer threatens that relationship more mm -hmm. than anything and it also it's sort of unspoken but i think that there's also a a bit of a struggle that ben is having with the fact that his friendship with with strummer is is being is taking a backseat to Strummer's new love, mm -hmm. new relationship. So, uh, but but yeah, that's that's something that we introduced in the first volume, and then this builds upon upon that in the second. Yes, it does. Yes. Um. Yeah, that, I'm sorry. That's all I'm going to say. So, thank you very much. Um. Was it planned to have? the Minotaur and Chad, one of the vampire brothers to make cameos to play like minor roles in this volume. Was that planned all along? Yeah. I wanted to keep some continuity mm -hmm. between the two volumes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that Sarah lit our editor 
would have killed me if I hadn't brought Aster the Minotaur back from the first volume. Uh, you know, he became kind of a just a great sounding board for Ben, especially. Yes. Uh, because they have so much they have so much in common. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the scene near the end where Ben and and Aster share a drink mm -hmm. at at the bar is I think what was one of my favorite scenes to write in the yes. whole second series. And mm -hmm. it's not spoiling anything to say that that you know that they have you know they have a sit down. Yeah. And and it's great because I love it was just this is off the cuff. I didn't put this down was I just love it where they're just talking. They're just having a beer and just talking about what's you know hey what's going on with you hey and it, it was it was great, you know. Um, this is the perfect segue. I love the speakeasies. Um, the speakeasy. So, and listeners, so a speakeasy is called is called a blind pig or a blind tiger. Basically, these were the illegal bars that served alcohol during the prohibition during the 1920s. But today, um, today's definition of speakeasy is a bar meant to be shrouded in secrecy. And I've read um, when I was doing some research on speakeasies, you know, it wasn't in depth or anything, but I think like there are some restaurants that it, the speakeasy is like a bar inside the restaurant. I'm going to ask you, how did you come up with the speakeasy for this story? We're not going to say anything about where the speakeasy is because it's, I, it's great, but how did you come up with the speakeasy? So there is, uh, uh, a, f a few so the speakeasy for for the listener is uh, is a place in our story where uh these supernatural creatures can go and hang out in mm -hmm. secrecy and and be themselves hang yes. around their own kind and and not feel uh you know the pressures to, to hide themselves from from ordinary humanity i was visiting my sister in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, this was a, this was over a decade ago now. And, uh, the, the, the guy she was seeing at the time, uh, took us to this bar or so I thought, and we walk into a garage mm -hmm. and it just looks like a garage. And there's an old refrigerator against the back wall. Mm hmm and he walks over to that refrigerator against the back wall and opens it up. And it's not a refrigerator at all. It's a door mm -hmm. into the building behind the garage, which was uh -huh. this speakeasy. And it was just a really great time. And so um, obviously I do, dialed up the, and you know, Jason, I dialed up the supernatural element of that to 11, yes. but kind of wanted to sort of honor that experience with the speakeasy that I introduced oh. in mm. the uh, in the book. Oh, that's so great. That's a cool story of how you came up with it. Um, and I just love the scene where they go in, they, we first go into the speakeasy. I love it because it kind of, and like you said, it's, you know, it's a place where, you know, all these supernatural characters can go there and just be themselves. You know, there's no pressure, you know, of, you know, is someone, you know, um, there's no pressure, you know, they're, they're just themselves they can be in their for their, their natural form you know and, they, and it's a place where they can all relax have you know have drinks or or what or have you know just have you know just talk to somebody um and i love it because it kind of reminds me of when john wick in the first movie when he goes down in the hotel he has to literally go into the basement and then you know it opens. He opens it up. It, we, as the audience, we're like, "Oh my god, look at this place!" You know, it's a nice bar. There's singers. All the hitmen are there and everything. But everyone's just relaxing, having a good time. I, 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 I just love that. I just love those scenes. Um, well, going back to the comic, I, um, I just love those scenes um, that you have in the bar with, you know, whether it's Ben and the Minotaur or. When um when we when we're introduced to um Madeline, so it's just great. Um, Eric, the other thing I also love about this volume, and you've had it in the first volume as well, is I also love the subtle humor because it feels organic. 
Um, and especially now, I'm not going to give away anything, but I love the one scene where Ben appears to Carly, um, Strummer's girlfriend, and Ben said, "That's right, I'm half Dingen." Surprise! And Carly goes, "Gin? I, I, I thought you don't drink." It was how <laughs> it was. It was. It, it felt natural. It was. It was. It was funny. It was great. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, so I love I I love working for Ahoy and I love this book. And the thing about this book is that it is notoriously Ahoy, which is a publisher that is known for its for having a sense of humor. This is their least funny book. So I really wanted to inject this book with a with a lightheartedness and a sense of humor even though it's not a comedy i definitely wanted to make sure that there was a sense of humor in the book mm -hmm. um and there are you know there are plenty of opportunities to kind of do those quippy one-liners even mm -hmm. if the scenarios that we have are a little on the darker side especially considering the entire canon of books that ahoy publishes mm -hmm. I think the other thing I also love about your humor that you put in here is um, it's um, it feels real. And like I said, it, it's organic. It's natural because because if someone comes up going, hey, I'm a uh, I'm a ding, you know, I'm a ding and you're going to wait. Someone can go, wait, what? Wait, you want a gin? What? You know, because it could be the misinterpretation. Yeah, you know, someone misheard what the person said, you know. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, um, I'm gonna the shout outs. Who do you want to give shout outs to? Because I know you want to give shout outs yeah. to Wendell, your art, um, your art, your amazing artist. Yeah, <laughs> Wendell is as you know the co-creator of this book. And I this book would be a completely different project without him. Uh he always brings so much to the table. I know that I can trust him to interpret the story. Uh, and he does it so well. I think he loves this book as much as I do. Uh, one of the great things about the trade paperback is that we he opens up his sketchbook and shows us kind of his process, mm -hmm. a lot of character designs and and page layouts and sketches and and just drawings that he did of these characters for fun. It's always a pleasure to work with him. I hope that I can continue to make books with with mm -hmm. Wendell for another hundred years. Um, and then, of course, you know, Wendell on interiors is joined by the always brilliant Liana Kangas mm -hmm. on covers uh, returning from the first volume. The Liana wanted to do these covers that kind of homage pulp fiction uh, mm -hmm. novel covers from the fifties and sixties, but then done in that, um, neon color palette that liana is so well yes. known for mm -hmm. and i think that it's just it's just brilliant especially the, the the issue four cover which is the one that we determined we decided to use for the trade paperback it's mm -hmm. it's just perfect it just perfectly captures the story mm -hmm. and the the stakes and the and the atmosphere of the book of course uh you know sarah lit uh mm -hmm. the editor uh uh, always a pleasure to work with her. She has a very good instinct yes. for stories, mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm I'm so glad that we can have conversations about about these characters and their motivations, and, and she mm -hmm. can definitely help guide the book to completion. And uh, Rob Steen did the lettering, mm -hmm. uh, just just always a great job. And then uh, one more shout out is you know to Corey Settlemeyer, yes. who is the collections editor for Ahoy. Uh, Corey has been a buddy of mine for. 25 years now mm -hmm. uh we both we both herald from northwest ohio mm -hmm. uh so we shopped at the same local comic store way way back in the day so i've known i've known him since before either of us was a professional mm -hmm. uh and it's just it was just exciting to uh to work with him and then of course the 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 senior management uh and editorial staff hearts mm -hmm. Seely, the uh, for taking a chance on this book in the first place and then giving us a second shot, Tom Pyre and Stuart Moore. Mm -hmm. Just, just, I love working with Ahoy. Yes. Um, you know, I hope this is not our last, this is not our last rodeo. Okay. Now, if Sarah calls you, 
and says, hey, you know, let's have another blacksmith story. Do you have another story sitting in your desk drawer or you have one lined up already? I, I know exactly. So without spoiling too much, mm -hmm. again, you know, and apologies to the listeners, but please read the book. Uh, this volume is very much Strummer's Empire Strikes Back, right? It is definitely <laughs> oh, yeah. a, it is definitely a, it definitely ends on a bit more of a down note than our first volume mm -hmm. and definitely begs for a third volume in the trilogy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Sarah, call me. I'm ready. Wendell's ready. Let's do it. Um, nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, but that's ultimately a Hoy's decision. That's ultimately yes. mm -hmm. a lot hinges on the success of the second trade paperback. So mm -hmm. I hope people will pick it up, let their local comic stores know that they, they want the book, that they enjoyed mm -hmm. the book. You know, word of mouth is, is all that we can hope for right now. Okay. Um, your introduction was written by the great Tony Isabella. I um before I asked the questions, like it, it was his introduction was so uplifting and it was a positive one. I love it. So how did you guys get Tony to write the introduction? So uh the 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 most amazing thing happened when the uh about a year ago is unprompted unasked for tony posted on his social media on his website mm -hmm. uh, and he often does this if you follow him on facebook or on twitter he does these posts occasionally and he calls them things that make me happy yes and it's and it's you know it's it's tv shows it's novels it's it's comic books and out of the blue he posted that he had picked up the first volume of blacksmith from his local comic store and that it, he and that he loved it so that was a surprise to me it was a surprise to the powers that be at ahoy mm -hmm. uh had no idea it was coming uh so when it came time to assemble this trade paperback sarah reached out to me and said hey how do you feel about us approaching tony isabella to do the second volume introduction and you know it was a hell of an honor that he said yes that was super exciting mm -hmm. and you know we've got the co-creator of black lightning out here nice. talking saying nice things about my book uh is is just a, a fantastic honor and then you bookend that with uh john layman who did the the introduction to the first volume and it's mm -hmm. you know it's it's always exciting when these people these these professionals that you look up to and have looked up to for decades like your work mm -hmm. yeah. that's great um i'm gonna slowly start wrapping things up what was sure. the most fun or exciting thing that you love working on on the first on these two volumes um i am you know i i love i love writing character moments mm -hmm. and strummer and ben especially in their friendship is such a rich and uh, exciting experience to kind of explore that with these characters. Um, you know, we we do put these characters through the ringer in the second volume, so it yes. was very nice to be able to uh, uh, to revisit them, uh, and then also to build this world around them. You know, mm -hmm. it's whether it's revisiting these characters like Aster from the first volume, mm -hmm. or bringing in the witches and the uh, you know, the whatever the hell Beatrice is. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to leave that to, to the readers. But oh, yes, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, it's just, just, a, just a great world building exercise. All right. So, Eric, I'm going to start. I'm going to change the subject. Sure. Olive, the last paladin. I know um, now this Kickstarter is already over um, and I have backed it. Um, can I just ask you, what, what is the story about? Sure. So all of the last Paladin is a new project that I am in the process of developing. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the story of Olive Roland, who is a former U S army intelligence officer who is uh, ex accidentally or uh, exposed to a chemical uh, on the job and it renders her unable to experience pain. So 
because of this accident and what the military perceives as a disability, mm-hmm. she's honorably discharged and given a hell of a settlement because yeah. you know, this shouldn't have happened. Uh, instead of retiring and riding off into the sunset, she takes that money and she reinvents herself as kind of a uh, a gun for hire uh, or the 21st century equivalent of a gun for hire. You can't really call yourself that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a, tr- a professional troubleshooter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then, you know, goes off and has adventures. And it's really a, uh, it's a love letter to uh, procedural television shows, which is something that I think network TV has gotten away from mm-hmm. in the last 20 or so years where you could tune into an episode of the A-Team or yeah. the Equalizer yes. or MacGyver, and you didn't need to watch every episode in the, uh, yeah. in, in the series to know what was going on. So I really wanted to, to do that in comics and have a, a, a series that had ongoing characters, but every issue would be a done in one. Mm-hmm. So I ran a Kickstarter. Uh, we're still in the process of, of finalizing a, a, a long-term home for the book. But I already had the first issue illustrated and lettered. So I thought for uh, Kickstarter's Make 100 project, which Mm -hmm. uh, last year I had done a reprint of my Orphans graphic novel. I thought, well, I can just do a a hundred copy run of this black and of the black and white edition of this book Mm -hmm. to put in people's hands and, uh, uh, you know, to kind of uh, whet their appetites for what will hopefully be an ongoing series in the near future. I can't really speak mm-hmm. yet to what the, the status of that is, yeah. but uh, the black and white edition was a success on Kickstarter. Uh, newly minted Ringo Award winner Ellie Wright has done the coloring on the book, so there will be a color edition coming oh. soon. Uh, and then hopefully sooner than later, I'll be able to talk about, you know, ways for for people to to find the book and to continue doing issues okay i'm gonna say i'm i'm glad i was one of those 100 that backed it because i would have been i really been would have been bummed if i had missed out oh okay that's so cool all right um we're gonna start uh, slowly wrapping things up um please feel free to promote comic-con revolution um and that, and for listeners, that's going to come out on May 18th and 19th. Actually, I'm going to let you tell you, uh, I'm going to let you, I'll let you um, promote why this is going to be a little more special for you. Yeah. So on uh, Comic-Con Revolution is a show that I've done several years in a row now. It's a really fun two-day show in Ontario, California, uh, that I've had the uh, privilege of doing in May of the last several years. The exciting thing about this year, though, is that my sister, Adrienne, is also going to be a guest at the show. And it's the first time since San Diego uh, 2019, I think, mm-hmm. yeah. where she and I have been at a show together. So, uh, you know, it's going to be really fun to, like, uh, promote No Angel again together, mm-hmm. as well as our individual projects, and as well as to spend some quality time with my sister. She's very busy. She lives in a different part of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't see each other as often as we'd like. So mm-hmm. very much looking forward to that. Oh, that's so cool. That's going to that's gonna be nice. Um, now I'm going to jump to the fun question. Yeah. How long have you been a Detroit's Lion fan? Because... <laughs> So uh, pretty much my whole life, uh, Mm -hmm. I am from Ohio, but I'm from Toledo, Ohio, which for people who are not familiar with the the geography of the of the Midwest, uh, Toledo is right on the border between Ohio and Michigan. And it's about 35 minutes outside of Detroit. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we really always felt kind of like a Detroit suburb. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so so that's I've been a Detroit sports fan across the board. You know, and and having been a long suffering Lions fan, yes. getting to see them mm-hmm. perform as well as they did the last couple of years was really exciting. And, um, you know, I got to be on uh, Blake's buzz yesterday. Blake is a huge Kansas City Chiefs yes. fan. And I had really, you know, we were 30 minutes away from the from our teams meeting each other in the Super Bowl, which would have been fantastic. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was great. Um, I off the cuff question. Have you been? Um you know, like, are you, 
is you and your family are they season ticket holders for the line no I, no we were always uh you know we were always avid watchers but we didn't really attend live sh games i haven't really in spite of living so close to detroit i never actually went to a professional or uh, you know a top Mm -hmm. league yeah. level sporting event until after I left Toledo I've seen the Red Wings play a number of times but always in Columbus when they played the Blue yeah. Jackets when I lived there um, my first professional baseball game I didn't see until I moved out here to Seattle mm -hmm. so oh, okay. uh, you know it's you know it's it's it, I, and I, I kind of regret not taking opportunities especially all those years when the Lions were terrible and tickets would have been cheap Yes. Now they're going to be super expensive because <laughs> they're doing so well. Uh, All right. Um, last question. Any closing words to our listeners? Uh, I just want to say, you know, thanks to all of the, the people out there who have heard me on this podcast or other podcasts and been compelled to check out the books that I make. Uh, I'm so proud of the work that I've done, but ultimately they're meaningless unless people are reading them. So just, Thank you. And please cancel whatever Valentine's Day plans you had and go buy Blacksmith Volume 2, The Key to His Heart, uh, on Wednesday. Eric, on that note, mahalo. Thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you. I wish you all the success with Blacksmith, The Key to His Heart, trade paperback. I want to thank Hannah of Superfan Promotion for setting up this interview. Hannah, thank you very much um, for setting this up and for the advanced um, reading copy. Thank you very much, Hannah. Now, if you are a new um, comic book reader or a lifelong comic book reader who loves crime noir and horror, please check out Blacksmith, the key to his heart trade that comes out on Valentine's Day. Um, and also, too, if you you know, if you're in your shop and you're picking up this trade, and if you um, if you have not picked up the first trade, the blacksmith, please just pick up both volumes. Um, it's, you know, I've, I've, I've read both of the, these are great. I love it. And Eric, I am being serious when I say this. Listeners, if you know, who, uh, if you know someone who is a comic book fan and loves crime, noir, and horror, please consider picking up both of these volumes. Um, of this series, you know, and I'm going to, I know it's going to sound funny, but also too, you know, you can give it as a gift, but also like either as a birthday gift or even as a, as a Valentine's Day gift. So, you know, just think about it. It's, it would be a pretty um, cool gift to give away. Um, I want to thank Drew, the co-host of Comics for Fun and Profit for putting this episode together. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. And if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes that comes out every Saturday. And I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha. Check out beacons.ai slash comics fun profit for all the C4 FAP links you could ever need all in one place. You can provide feedback, listen, support, share, enjoy these we have our patreon there you can buy us a beer or a coffee you can check out our instagrams our twitters our facebooks check out our youtube page you can email us you can listen to our podcasts on patreon if you're a subscriber on apple podcasts spotify on podbean we have google podcasts on there we have an amazon wish list you want to buy kyle and i something fine you can do that here. We appreciate it. We have Kyle's RPG podcast listed on there. So you can check out his Dork Day Afternoon offerings. We have Cowabunga links. So you can check out the Cowabunga Deep Discount FOC and Pre-Order List. Get on that. That's our LCS. So you can check that out as well. And we want to just give you opportunities to say hi, to check out what we're doing, support us if you would like, or just listen. Check out beacons.ai slash comics fun profit for all the c4 fap links you could ever need thanks back to the show